This video is sponsored by Squarespace. It was 6.30 a.m. in Hutchinson, Kansas. Jeff Kleeman, an executive with United Artists at the time, was handed a hard hat, a gas mask, and a flashlight. His small team climbed into a rickety, suspect elevator with a shift of miners and descended 600 feet underground into a functioning salt mine. Just the previous year, in 1993, Jeff Kleeman had been listening in on a call between his boss, John Callie, and his close friend, Stanley Kubrick. Callie had worked previously with Kubrick on 1971's A Clockwork Orange and now ran United Artists. But this wasn't a social call, as Callie asked Kubrick about a long forgotten project that he believed he had written for the studio, a biopic on Napoleon. Callie relayed that they had been searching for it, but couldn't find it and asked Kubrick if he could send him a copy of the script. Kubrick laughed and said, John, the reason your guy couldn't find it, it doesn't exist. I made a deal, but I never wrote it. Callie, undeterred by this, sent Kleeman out to try and find it in their storage facility in the salt mines. Studios have kept archived materials in mines like these for decades, and as Kleeman stepped out of the elevator and into the mine on an early morning in 1994, they began to search the miles of tunnels and archives that were stored there. With only a flashlight to search, Kleeman and his team discovered forgotten cinema treasures like footage from The Wizard of Oz, 17 minutes of deleted scenes from 2001 A Space Odyssey, and various long-forgotten manuscripts and projects that never saw the light of day. But they couldn't find the Napoleon script. Kleeman says, just as he was about to give up, I open up this one script, and it's Napoleon. He rushed back out of the salt mine and faxed a copy of it to John Cali. John Callie, thrilled to have found this long-forgotten script, called up his friend. Stanley, you did write the script. Let's make it. After a long pause, Kubrick spoke definitively on the other end of the line. I don't want to make it, and I don't want it made. This mysterious project derived from intensive research by Kubrick in 1970, striking a deal with the Romanian army to have over 30,000 extras, years of meticulous research on the Napoleonic era, and even a hunt for rare film lenses for the film's various sex scenes. Join us as we delve deep into the story of Kubrick's Napoleon on our abandoned film series. Well, I became interested in the idea that <clears throat> the universe uh, was full of intelligent civilizations, which is the current scientific belief, that there are so many stars in the universe that the likelihood of life evolving around them, even if it were possibilities of one in a million, there would be hundreds of millions. What you're seeing here is a rare interview with Stanley Kubrick about his 1968 film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it's at the conclusion of this production that we begin our story. Riding the wave of his first major box office breakthrough of his career and using the various awards received for this film as leverage, Kubrick knew that he could make any film he wanted. And he used that power to persuade MGM to fund the development costs for his Napoleon film. Kubrick declared there had never been a great historical film and there had never been a good or accurate movie about Napoleon and he was determined to be the person to change that. He devoured previous films on Napoleon like Abel Gantz's 1927 five-hour saga on Napoleon, but Kubrick determined it to be terrible and crude and declared that this would be the best movie ever made. He would continue on watching every other Napoleonic era film ever created, and there were a lot of them. IMDb has a list of 72 Napoleon films, while others report close to 200 Napoleon films over the years. And in Kubrick's time, there were an average of three films a decade on Napoleon from the very start of cinema. After viewing and studying these films, he began his painstaking research and obsession of all things Napoleon. Malcolm McDowell, who starred in Kubrick's Clockwork Orange years later, asked Kubrick on set why he was eating ice cream at the same time as his main course steak. What's the difference, said Kubrick. It's all food. This is how Napoleon used to eat. Accounts like these over the years by those who have worked for Kubrick have helped to almost mythicize him to the point where who he truly was will never be known. But when it comes to his work on this film, it appears that Kubrick sees himself in Napoleon. In several interviews, Kubrick likened running a major film production to that of organizing major campaigns for war, and several others around him noted a change in his character during and after doing research on Napoleon. And from the few hundred books and 18,000 documents on Napoleon he reportedly read, Kubrick fell hard into this addiction that has claimed countless other directors and actors over the years particularly with the more auteur directors, with even Spielberg and Ridley Scott still chasing down the character of Napoleon today. But we'll talk about them later on. 
And you just can't help but wonder how Kubrick's obsession over Napoleon would show itself today. Maybe he'd use our sponsor Squarespace to publish all of his findings and research after he completed the film. With Squarespace's new Fluid Engine, you can move your pieces around the board easier than Napoleon moved across Europe, conquering everything in his path. And when you get stuck out in the battlefield in the cold winter, Squarespace will keep running that beautiful gallery you have to show off for new clients. Because, you know, unlike Napoleon, Squarespace thrives in the cold. So head over to squarespace.com slash framevoyager to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using the code framevoyager. Now, back to an abandoned Napoleon. For the next two years, Kubrick devoted himself to researching anything he could find on Napoleon, first hiring a renowned scholar, an Oxford professor Felix Markham, as his historical advisor for the film, even purchasing the rights to the biography he had written on Napoleon. This was billed as a bit of a tactic to keep everyone else in the historical community and other authors from trying to claim that Kubrick stole their work for his film. A bit of a legal protection, you could say, and one to avoid the headache of dealing with that specific problem. It wasn't the only headache that Kubrick set out to solve as he began his research. During his time making his previous film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, he had been bombarded constantly with questions from costumers and set details, inevitably taking up a lot of his time. This time around, he was determined to get all of this organized from the very beginning, creating an entirely new picture file retrieval system that included 15,000 photo entries on anything he could find on Napoleon in his research. This allowed costumers to cross-reference and find any detailed information they needed to keep to the historical accuracy of the film without having to bother Kubrick. And that wouldn't be the only extensive system that he would create for this film either. Kubrick was absolutely devoted to telling the story as accurately as possible, and that started with the historical happenings of his characters in the film. For all of the 50 principal characters in the script, he organized their positioning and life concurrent with Napoleon from birth to his death. He constructed this with index cards that were matched up with key moments in Napoleon's life. That way, when he was writing the script for the film, he would be able to see where each character was historically at that time and what they were doing in relation to Napoleon. While all of this organization would be key in not only pulling off a film of the scale, but also to do an accurate historical portrayal, Kubrick had other problems that needed to be solved, namely the budget. There were several elements that were noted to be issues in the budgeting of this film. The massive amounts of extras needed, making uniforms for all of those extras, set construction, and as he said, overpriced movie stars, and also cost of reenacting sea battles. For the extras and locations, Kubrick tackled several issues, the first being location. Originally, he wanted to film all of the battle scenes at the locations where the battles had originally occurred. He quickly found that to be a difficult prospect because of modernization and many of the battlefields had already been overtaken by buildings or development projects, making them unsuitable locations. Oddly enough, Kubrick would take soil samples from these locations to ensure that when they did find a location for the battle scenes, they would bring in the right color soil to put under Napoleon's feet. These locations also had another issue though, and that had to do with the enormous amounts of extras to recreate these battle scenes. Kubrick reportedly wanted around 50,000 soldiers for this reenactment, and he estimated that it would take around 1,000 trucks to get those 50,000 extras out onto the set. And at the same time, there had to be accommodations for that amount of people to make it work, further limiting the locations he could choose from. But you don't just sign up 50,000 extras from some casting agency. So after he settled on Yugoslavia as the location for his battle scenes, he approached the Romanian government to hire tens of thousands of troops for a reported $2 a man per day. Yugoslavia also offered to supply troops for the film at the rate of $5 a day per man. It's kind of a bizarre thought to imagine this many troops in today's world just walking around in another country for a film without causing some sort of international incident. Though he had the troops and extras needed to pull off these massive battle sequences, he also needed to make costumes for all of them a lot of them. At first, Romania and Yugoslavia offered to jointly make the costumes at $40 per person, a drastic reduction in what he was quoted in England. But a New York firm came in and spoiled this deal for the two countries, figuring out a completely new way of manufacturing these uniforms to a cost of $4 each, helping to massively reduce the budget. And while the battle scenes would be a major focal point for this film, not all of the scenes were set on the battlefield, and sets needed to be developed for those scenes as well. But making historically accurate castles and numerous palaces proved to be a costly endeavor, with estimates ranging from $3 million to $6 million, which back in 1969 was kind of unheard of. And considering the film Cleopatra, one of the most expensive films ever made, 
had bombed at the box office and had made studios gun shy on unusually large budgets, building sets for Kubrick's Napoleon was not an option. Instead, through his research, Kubrick identified several palaces and venues within France and Italy that he could use instead that would require little to no alterations to maintain their historical accuracy of the Napoleonic era. He was able to rent these out for only a few hundred dollars a day, which is a massive difference in cost. Uh, well, you know, Stanley, his strength, I would say, is probably not in communicating <laughs> narratives. As for the actors that he built overpriced, his plan was to use a couple great actors and then a bunch of new actors and actresses to keep that aspect of the budget on the low end. For the lead role of Napoleon, he had his eye on Jack Nicholson, which is kind of hilarious considering the actor playing Napoleon in Ridley Scott's version of the film, Joaquin Phoenix, also acted as the Joker, just like Jack Nicholson would later famously do as well. Lastly, the sea battles were a massive issue expense-wise. To combat this issue, he decided that he would show a map version of the sea battle with voiceovers explaining what happened and cutting to easy to shoot scenes like a drowned French admiral floating in the water or ships lying on the bottom of the sea. Now that Kubrick was somewhat settled on getting everything worked out for the budget, he also had to figure out how he wanted to film it. And if there is anything to be said about Kubrick's work, it's his willingness and passion to push cameras, lenses, and the film itself past the boundaries of technology at the time. And some would say that that is Kubrick's greatest gift to the world of cinema. For Napoleon, it was no different. He hunted down lenses that would allow him to shoot well past the hours film crews in that day would have worked. He wanted to shoot Napoleon with natural light whenever that was possible, sometimes with barely any light at night. One of the specific use cases for these lenses would be to film the various sex scenes between Napoleon and his wives and mistresses throughout the film. Many of these would only be filmed with candlelight to illuminate the scene. Or as the script details for one scene, the candlelit oval bedroom completely encircled with floor to ceiling mirrored panels which multiply the erotic images of Napoleon and Josephine making love. As Kubrick was wrapping up his all-consuming two-year research, the film industry was on the move. MGM by 1969 was in financial trouble and would soon be under new management that was more interested in television and building casinos than it was funding a massive historical film. Initially, when MGM agreed to fund Napoleon's pre-production budget, it had not actually greenlit the film. So when Kubrick finished up this screenplay and sent it off to MGM in September 1969, he was unable to persuade MGM to finance his film. And to make matters worse, there were three other Napoleon films in production at the time, with the film Waterloo releasing in 1970 and the others by 1971. All of them were box office disasters, likely not giving MGM any more confidence in this expensive film. Kubrick would have to walk away from MGM after they cut funding, and he had to fire his entire team working on the Napoleon film. After a while, he would land at Warner Brothers, where he would sign a three-film deal that gave him total control over the projects with Warner Brothers just agreeing to distribute the films, no questions asked. Additionally, five to seven years after the films were released, he would get sole rights to the film. With this new freeing deal in place, Warner Brothers announced their partnership with Kubrick and the start of a new film, A Clockwork Orange, which Kubrick stated in the release that he would make his Napoleon epic after completing this film. Kubrick would quickly complete this then X-rated film and release it by 1972 to success and also a lot of controversy. Around the same time, another British television production of Napoleon, Napoleon in Love, would air and also completely fail. Around the same time, Jack Nicholson also decided he was not interested in playing Napoleon anymore. Kubrick would never submit his Napoleon script to Warner Brothers, and it's not really known why if he couldn't work out the script, if the other Napoleon projects failing and audiences showing a lack of interest in the topic or the difficulty that this film presented. No one knows exactly why he never submitted a finished screenplay. And after the long years spent meticulously researching for this film, despite Kubrick talking about the film a few more times and even considering turning it into a 20 hour television show and using the research for the film Barry Lyndon, this film was abandoned and seemed likely to never be resurrected with Kubrick's death in 1999. Strange Love 2001 A Space Odyssey and A Clockwork Orange has died at the age of 70 at his home in Hertfordshire. Stanley Kubrick was widely regarded as one of the greatest and most controversial masters of cinema. He'd just finished what was to be his last film, Eyes Wide Shut. Despite it being abandoned, it would indirectly inspire Ridley Scott to make his first film, The Duelist. And Ridley Scott would eventually somehow acquire the screenplay, but decided that it was underwhelming because of its length and in covering his birth to his death, 
decided to go a different direction for his Napoleon film in 2023. But a decade ago in 2013, Spielberg announced on a French TV network that he would be making a miniseries based on Kubrick's screenplay. However, almost a decade would go by with very little information or confirmation on whether or not Spielberg still intended to make this series. And then finally, in February 2023, Spielberg would finally make an announcement. So we are working on Napoleon as a, a seven-part uh, limited series. But we are uh, mounting a big production uh, with the cooperation of uh, Christian Kubrick and Jan Harlan. We're mounting a large production for HBO on, based on Stanley's original script, Napoleon. While Kubrick never so got to realize his dream and vision for the Napoleon film before he died, it seems that almost 45 years later, that vision might finally become a reality someday, turning the status of an abandoned project to a finished one. And if you like abandoned projects and movies, you should definitely check out our other episode, The Abandoned Batgirl Movie, right here, which has been surprisingly quite controversial.